Good to see you all. Uh, I think it would be nice to just start. I'm going to give about uh, half a minute for people to just look at the people on your screens. If you click on gallery view, you can probably see uh, see all the people here. Just take a minute to let in that our our old friends are here. Uh, maybe people we haven't yet met. Since we can't all be in a room together, it helps to just let this powerful medium be a way to connect. All right. Well, I'm happy to be here with you. It's nice to see. Folks, <clears throat> I'm going to give a talk this morning, which I have entitled Shame, Healing, Wholeness, and Atonement. <clears throat> so, you know, I'm giving this talk because I think uh, it's good for us to feel whole. Um, it's good for us to heal and be involved in healing. Um, the act of atonement is powerful and liberative. And uh, shame is a very complex and deep part of the human condition. So, um, <clears throat> There are two, what I'm going to use in this talk, I'm going to talk about two very distinct definitions of shame, which cause confusion um, when talking about shame. So there's a very popular contemporary definition of shame that my guess is most people here would think is the definition of shame, or that's pretty common. I kind of think this is what shame means. So the simple way of putting this is shame is uh, the sense that one is fundamentally bad. So guilt is a, a feeling or a complex of feelings and thoughts that's, that's, that where we think I did something bad or I've done something bad. And shame is uh, the complex of thoughts and feelings that is I am bad. So uh, shame is this uh, corrosive, very uh, reified, solid sense that the self is uh, damaged. <clears throat> so that's a, a really powerful and useful framing that uh, many of us are accustomed to. Interestingly, there's a, a, a very pervasive other definition of shame, and in particular in relation to guilt, that we find in Buddhist teachings and in, uh, in Western psychology and cultural theories up until maybe the last 30 or 40 years. And in this formulation, shame is um, respect for public censure. So shame is the ability when someone or when the public thinks you have done something wrong to take it in and let that motivate you to do something beneficial to make a change. Whereas guilt is an internal uh, sense of wrongdoing. So the, the difference between shame and guilt is whether the process is principally internal or external. <clears throat> and uh, there's tons of, there's some really powerful research that was very groundbreaking and influential by a woman named Ruth Benedict, a uh, cultural anthropologist who, uh, I, I went down the rabbit hole on Ruth Benedict <laughs> researching this, but all I can say, she was a, a mentor to the great Margaret Mead and a, and a pioneering uh, woman ac academic up at Columbia. But anyway, she, she was really interested in how different cultures handle these two polarities of emphasizing um, a responsiveness. Oh my goodness. Now that's gotta be embarrassing. I just feel, a profound sense of uh, 
beneficial shame when I realized I'd left my phone on for this Dharma talk. Oh, well. so, um, so these, uh, this second set of definitions for shame and, and guilt are actually the standard ways that you see them talked about in Buddhist literature. So if you look at older uh, Buddhist translations, they will translate the two, these two often paired, um, often paired things of shame in terms of public censure or internal guilt. Um, they're atrapya uh, is the um, public sense of shame and hri is the uh, internal sense. So uh, these are, you see them in many different Buddhist psychological systems. And uh, those of you who studied Yogacara with me in the 11 beneficial mental factors in Yogacara's 30 verses on consciousness only, the second and third beneficial mental factors are atrapya and hri. So interestingly, uh, you, if you look at old translations of Buddhist texts, you'll see this word shame is a beneficial factor. And everyone I know who uses the contemporary definition, oh, that's so weird, these Buddhists, what are they thinking? And it's like, well, they're thinking about it in a different way. Semantics matters a lot. So recognizing that when you're having a conversation with people and you're getting stuck, just pausing to say, are we using this word in different ways? And let's just find our definitions. It can make a huge difference in that conversation. So um, it, what's interesting about this to me is that the beneficial phenomena in, in uh, Vasubandhu system that he just takes from other lists, he hasn't made it up. It's just, he, he, he's using a common list. Faith, conscience, humility. So I translate, I translated with Wei Jian Tang in my translation of the 30 verses, uh, guilt or free as conscience, the internal sense. And I was like, there's no way I can put shame in this and not confuse people at this point with the way people think about shame. So we use the word humility. Uh, there wasn't a great word um, to sum it up, but if you're looking at that text, you'll see conscience and humility. The thing is most of the beneficial factors are really pleasant to experience, equanimity, um, nonviolence, energy, carefulness, lack of aversion. It's like, oh, nice. And these two, that, in my experience, they don't feel that great. They don't feel that great. So when I have a pang of conscience and I feel I've done something wrong, it's like, oh, I don't, I can't claim that I just love that experience. But it has been very helpful to me. It's been very beneficial. And likewise, being able, if someone comes and says, you know, you did something harmful to take it in, and acknowledge it and feel that um, has been very, very beneficial. So uh, one of the things that I'm kind of learning here is that beneficial mental factors in uh, Buddhist psychology are not necessarily ones that are pleasant to feel. They are the ones that are conducive to healing, wholeness, and well-being. <clears throat> so, in dealing with this, and I'll return to this as I go through, but the most important component of our investigation of these and what I would hope that this talk could point to is a willingness and a interest in investigating our emo own embodied emotional experience of the things I'm talking about. So being able to sit and, and be like, oh, I feel this in my body. You know, I've done my, it helps to do meditation practice. So we slow down, I feel this in my body. And this is kind of the emotional content of experience. And I'm having these kind of thoughts and they're self-judgmental. Oh, so that's that, that attacking shame. That's about how there's something fundamentally wrong with me. Or maybe just in that moment where someone says, you know, that really hurt my feelings. And you feel the blood rush to your face and you feel your heart come up a little bit. You go, oh. But this could be beneficial. I can let this in. I could experience this. So for your own personal investigation of mindfulness and body of emotion, which is the principal methodology for putting most of the teachings that you receive uh, in this place into action. So uh, I'm going to move on to the... Um, this kind of first and most contemporary definition of shame. So this 
uh, idea or this, it's a kind of a complex of ideas and feelings that there, there's something fundamentally wrong with me. I am bad um, or broken. And you may be like, oh, I know this inside and out. Uh, generally speaking, uh, most people that I talk to have some of this going on. Many people have a lot. And I cannot recommend enough an extensive course of therapy for just about anyone focused on healing shame because it's so corrosive. Um, and I don't have time. I mean, really could give many, many talks about this. So I'm trying to mostly talk about this in relationship to beneficial shame to create some air around it. But it's a much deeper topic than I can really get into generally. A lot of times shame is very hidden. So we will use a lot of other ways of framing what's happening and thinking about things and acting in order to avoid the feeling of shame because it's so, it's really painful. In Buddhist psychology, there isn't a, comp, uh, a comparable term for this phenomenon uh, as a distinct thing, but it's very clearly, it's just hatred of the self, hatred of the self, aversion towards the self. Um, and so that's like on the emotional affective level of, of like the Buddha Abhidharma sort of lists of psychological factors. But on a deeper level, shame from most of the contemporary theories about it, it's, it's about feeling cut off from the group. So for example, a child who is uh, traumatized by their parents will feel alienated from their parents. And that creates, that will tend to create lifelong conditions of shame. Likewise, like a, a lot of neglect because you feel cut off from the group because you're not being held within it. Or if you grow up, um, you grow up, maybe you're a young Asian American girl and you, you never find anywhere where you can purchase a doll, which you think looks like you. This will create a sense that you've been cut off from the whole of the community. And we could just look at many, many, many ways where um, the, what we receive in the outside world creates a sense that we're not a part of it. We are alienated. So this um, sense of alienation is, in my opinion, the core issue uh, in Mahayana Buddhism. There is nothing that is more emphasized in Mahayana Buddhism than the fact that we can resolve our tendency to feel separate from the universe, that we can realize our wholeness, that we can heal our sense of alienation and separation. And this is, this is just runs throughout the teachings. So um, this uh, particular sort of definition of shame that's like, uh, from a Buddhist perspective, you might just call self-hatred and, and, uh, and a hardened sense of self, it has its own energy. And I had a real realization of this uh, when I was, the last time I went to rehab for drug addiction and alcoholism, I was, uh, I like was, you know, doing a lot of trying to figure out what was going on. It was really, it was not pleasant. <laughs> anyway, at one point I was sitting there and I realized, you know, I hate myself and I hate my life. And I, I, the reason is I've done all these things that I believe were wrong. I know they were wrong. I harmed people I love. I damaged myself. And so I had this profound sense that was like, oh, I feel bad about myself because I've done a lot of harmful things. And I could just start doing the things that I actually believe in and I'll feel better. And it was like really empowering. Wow. So that has to do kind of with that, um, the other definition of shame, which is like, I kind of realized I got to look and, and guilt. I realized that this was violating my values and I can step into something else. But what I found out over the years was even though, uh, you know, I haven't had to drink or take drugs in like 25 years and I've had just unbelievable amounts of emotional healing. Um, I was, you know, I'd been sober for five or six years and I was still profoundly um, unhappy 
and going through mental health and emotional health crises. And uh, I found out through investigating my experience, coming, sitting down in Zen and just looking at my emo own emotional reality, that my tendency to feel the shame, the sense of shame in that I am a bad person, this corrosive, fundamental, reifying sense of the self as bad, it had its own energy. It was its own deal. And there was no way just doing a bunch of good stuff was going to heal it. I wasn't going to be a good boy into healing that. I had to heal it as its own phenomenon. Also, you know, doing helpful things does make me feel better. So <laughs> I try to do that too. So uh, anyway, we have great antidotes for this corrosive sense of shame in, in Buddhist psychology. So a couple of them are really surprising. Um, you know, I would, I'm kind of avoiding the real obvious ones, which is, you know, loving kindness practice. That's really good. I'm not going to avoid that. I'll talk about it. loving kindness practice, just sitting and directing loving thoughts to yourself, um, finding ways to notice when you're having a real negative um, self talk and just like doing something else, shifting your attention, just holding uh, the painful emotional state in awareness if you have the, the tolerance for it and, and being compassionate towards that. Being like, oh, this feeling is here. This, someone's suffering. Oh yeah, it's me. <laughs> so there's a lot there. Um, but just in, in root Buddhist doctrines, uh, one of the most powerful antidotes offered to this sense of shame is the doctrine of non-self. So this sense of shame that's like, I am bad, there has to be an I am. And non-self, the doctrine of non-self is not about negating or getting rid of self, it's just about freedom. It's about realizing that we are not bound to any solid thing. We are flux within flux, and that's freedom. The doctrine of non-self was about showing people that no matter who you, where you were born, how you were born, what caste you were born in, what gender you were born in, what, what you had done in the past, there wasn't a fixed self that you had to live out. You have the capacity for liberation. Everyone does always because there's not a fixed solid, eternal, lasting, separate self. So uh, this is, you know, there's many, many stories in the early Buddhist literature about this, but um, we talked, both Tim and I have talked about Padachara and her amazing, her recovery from profound trauma. Angela Mila, the notorious um, serial killer, who, his name means necklace of fingers, uh, this is a guy who killed so many people, he made a necklace of their fingers. I mean, he's really pretty disturbing character. And the story is amazing, but it comes down to the Buddha hears about him. He goes to him and meets him, and he says, you can be free. And so Angulamila ordains as a monk, and Buddha keeps him by his side and, and says, you can do this. And he finds profound freedom. <clears throat> so non-self... Uh, can crack through as we kind of, if you look at your experience and you notice that it's just flux because you're practicing meditation, you'd be like, oh, there can't be some fundamentally bad me because it's just a feeling that came up. It's just some idea that came into my mind, you dumbass. Sorry, uh, I don't even want to get into the kind of self-talk my consciousness used to produce towards me. It was, it's appalling. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, and I can laugh about it now, really. The other really nice uh, teaching we have Buddhism that's like a counter to this corrosive sense of fundamental badness, I am fundamentally bad, is Buddha nature. Now you can talk about Buddha nature a lot of ways. I'm gonna say Buddha nature means, uh, Buddha nature means your non-self is infinitely good. Your non-self is infinitely good. What Buddha realized was there was no fixed thing that was separate, that was a person, that was himself. 
He just realized that there's flux within flux. And the thing is, you're already flux within flux, whether you know it or not. So you're already Buddha. And it's good. If you look at the qualities that we associate with Buddha, compassion, love, energy for liberation, kindness, care, attention, commitment, they all already exist within the flux. They are yours. Although you can't really own them because non-selves can't own stuff because they're free. <laughs> so um, the talk is called Shame, Healing, Wholeness, and Atonement. Atonement is a word, you know, we associate it with like an amend or um, acknowledging and making up for a harm. The root meaning of atonement, uh, the root etymology of it, it comes from the two words at one. So it, as does healing. So healing comes from the, the Greek whole, as does the word holistic. So I was kind of playing with words, healing, wholeness, atonement, all of them come from the same fundamental concept that there is a way to be whole. And uh, we sometimes feel fractured and damaged and broken and cut off and we can find wholeness. So, um, moving on to the, the, the more Buddhist definition or these older Western ways of describing the term shame and guilt, an easy way to, to sort of do parse this is if you use the term sense of shame, a lot of people will kind of get what you mean. Like they'll, you'll look at someone who's doing something really horrible in public over and over again, and you'll say, that person has no sense of shame. And you might kind of get what we're talking about here. So um, these are beneficial things. It's really helpful to me to be able to take it in when someone comes to me or in public, it's like, oh yeah, you know, you, that really was not helpful. If I can take that in, I can, it helps me to make a change, to understand them, to care about their perspective. That doesn't mean that every time someone says I've done something wrong, I have to be like, yes, you're absolutely right. No, I get to be discerning, but the ability to just take it in is actually really important. Um, likewise, a sense of internal, uh, what we call, what we call guilt or conscience, but it, it helps, you know, I want to be investigating my life in terms of whether it's beneficial or harmful. And if you think you never do anything harmful, it's probably a bad sign. <laughs> I'm sorry. Life is complex. We are in complex systems. So um, one of the challenges is, and one of the reasons that we don't actually feel shame or guilt in these beneficial definitions um, is because we are consumed by the idea, the sense of shame that something is wrong with me. So when we receive censure or someone comes to us, oftentimes we can't really meet that wholly in a beneficial way because it triggers the sense, oh, something must be wrong with me. Or we're so afraid of touching the feeling that is somewhere hidden in us that there's something fundamentally wrong with us, that we dodge the question. We argue, we, what about it? What about this? But no, I, but what about your part? All that defensiveness to avoid that corrosive feeling of shame is something fundamentally wrong with us. So through mindfulness of the body and emotions, we can learn to be able to be sensitive to these tendencies. And so you go, oh, that, I don't wanna feel that, but I have the ego strength and the practice to tolerate it and be compassionate towards that feeling that's coming up and also to pause and see this other kind of feeling comes up and then to turn towards you and try and understand what you're saying to me because I wanna connect because the only way we can really heal and be whole is through connection. So we see this uh, idea of this kind of um, uh, shame in terms of being willing to accept public censure or be able to take it in and use it beneficially in the Metta Sutra, which many people here have chanted many times. We chanted every Saturday here. 
It says, uh, someone who is skilled in the path of peace, it says of them, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. So it's just acknowledging you want to be open, open to, to criticism and open to, um, yeah, reproval. So uh, just to recap that, that corrosive feeling that something is wrong with you will impedes our ability to really take in, um, take in this, but either our internal or our external sense of beneficial uh, humility and conscience. So all this ties into amends, you know, being a person, uh, you know, I, I learned how to make amends by being taught by a lot of people and it's an ongoing process. Um, one of the most amazing system for amends is something that is highly developed among people in addiction recovery. And there's a, people have given a lot of thought about how to do it well. Uh, you know, a simple way to think of it is if you have done something wrong, acknowledgement and action. So one, to just say, you know, I did something wrong and then to do something that actually repairs the damage is for something to be healed and whole for there to be atonement, there must be repair. So uh, many years ago, well, I don't actually know how long ago, in South Africa, they had um, a pioneering and really inspiring um, program, I guess you would call it, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission where people just sat down, people from many sides of what had been a really brutal, brutal conflict in South Africa. And people sat down and talked openly and in public about what they had done, much of which was incredibly harmful and violent, and what they had experienced, much of which was profoundly traumatic. And I remember being really, really inspired by this. It's wow. Um, and interestingly, here in the Twin Cities, the Minnesota Council of Churches, um, an organization with some, some great leaders, uh, Jim Baird Jacobs and uh, Curtis DeYoung, had just launched a 10-year project called the Truth and Reparations Project. And, uh, you know, here, the thing is, a lot of times people would like to have truth when there's harm, but not actually amend or take action to repair what was damaged. We see this extensively when it comes to racial harm in the United States. For people like, oh, let's just all get together, we're all one. And it's like, we're all one, but we're profoundly segregated. That's not amends. So Jim Bear and Curtis brilliantly, um, I think Jim Bear is probably more leadership and a lot of people are involved. Anyway, recognize that the language they wanna use is reparations. Say these, the churches there and their group is not just going to sit down and talk about uh, the harms that have been done and the harms that have been experienced, but really look at how to fix it. So uh, one of the great things we get uh, like in, the, in like a recovery context as you, as you work on amends is uh, how many times have I heard people say, I just got to stay on my own square or I got to clean up my side of the street. So the practice, learning to practice making an amend when you've done something that you think is harmful, that is entirely about your role is very powerful and super difficult and sometimes really painful and amazingly liberative. So I can just think of so many times I've, I've done something, you know, it could be even a really little, just some dumb thing I did, I forgot something. And it's like, I forgot something and the other person forgot something and now we have a little bit of a mess. And I kind of want to be like, yeah, well, I did this wrong, but you, you, you know, you really should have not done that. And I just keep trying to practice saying, I'm sorry, I forgot to do this thing that is my responsibility. And that's it. And it doesn't mean that I can't make room for the other person to, make some kind of uh, amend, but it's very freeing. And it really helps when you're having some difficulties with someone 
to be able to just say, I'm focused on my role in this, even if it's just part of the conversation. Because what you, how many conflicts you've been in where it's like you get all of this whataboutism? Well, I did this wrong, but what about her? And then, and then it's just a morass. But we can just step into like, I'm just claiming my space in this. So um, in the Dhammapada, it says, do not give your attentions to what others, oh, sorry, do not give your attention to what others do or fail to do. Give it to what you do or fail to do. And this is really simple. It's about acknowledging that you have liberative power and focusing your energy there. <clears throat> so it's really good to practice with just little things and then also practice it with big things. Um, we're involved in systems that are really, really harmful to people. Like for example, me as a white male, I receive um, access to health, safety and wealth that comes at the expense of people who are people of color and women. So I think that's harmful. So as some of you know, I try and take action to acknowledge it and to repair it. <clears throat> so uh, in Soto Zen, you know, every Tuesday and Saturday morning here, we do an acknowledgement of karma ritual. You should come. It's really good. You might be like, ritual is weird. I don't like it. I don't want to get up early. I don't know. what. Well, it's okay. You don't have to come. But, you know, I didn't like any of it either. I thought ritual was dumb and bizarre. Um, but now it's just a regular part of my life and it helps me. It helps me. And, you know, we just say all my ancient twisted karma, born of beginningless greed, hate, and delusion, I now fully avow. Just a couple times a week, I just step into this like, yep, this, comp this situation is really complex and vast. I'm not even taking the time right now to kind of parse it out. I'm just going to try letting that in because that can dissolve that sense of shame. Like I am bad. It's like, nope, we're all just here. And it's a big mess, samsara. And yet, and yet we're all just here. and We're all Buddha. We all have agency. We're all just flux. I think the last thing I want to say about this before I do a little guided meditation on the subject is that uh, my experience is that afflictive and beneficial tendencies tend to co-arise. They tend to co-arise. So, as one tries to engage and open up to a, um, an inner sense of conscience, to acknowledge, you know, when you have a feeling of guilt, like I, I feel like bad about this. And that can be really beneficial and helpful. And as you gain that ability to take in, you know, you read an article that sort of, um, it's like seems to be pointing to you as part of the problem. And you know, oh, to take that in that could be really, really beneficial to learn to take it in and, and, tr and try and find a way to help that inform how you live. But it tends to co-arise with this more corrosive sense of shame and it tends to activate it. And this is true, it's just like, if you think about like loving relationships, it, difficult and painful states co-arise with the amazing and wonderful states. And so we can just learn to be sensitive to the body sensitive to the emotions that arise and notice the thoughts so that we can start to move more freely within all of that flux. And we can start to real that it's, realize it's part of something vast and complete, that it's whole, that it's whole. And this can be a process that is very healing, very healing. So I want to do a brief uh, little visualization practice here, uh, which I will offer to you. And, um, you know, visualization is a way of um, accessing an amazing power of human consciousness. So I'm just going to invite you to 
find a place to, to you know, be sitting so you're fairly comfortable and upright and um, you can allow the eyes to close. Let the awareness settle in the body. If you can just feel the whole of the body. And as we do this brief practice, trying to keep our awareness broad. So we're holding the body in awareness and in particular, whatever emotions arise. Just letting whatever emotions come up, flow up within the field of your compassionate, spacious awareness. So I'd just like you to call to mind an occasion uh, where you were a part of a process of amends, uh, where someone was acknowledging a harm and then doing something reparative, a time when you were involved in something like this that really felt good and right. So it could be you making an amend for something harmful. It could be someone um, offering an amend to you, but an occasion where you were like, that was, that was really good and right. So this should be something that evokes a, a good feeling, if possible. So hopefully you've thought of something and I'd like you to just try and picture a particular moment of this process um, with your mind as vividly as possible. It, uh, in particular, maybe the moment where it might've been a little bit hard, like <laughs> a lot of times, like the, the process of these can be kind of difficult. So like when you're face to face with the person and uh, really having this conversation or whatever it was. So just try to like, pick, like really visually remember where you were, what things looked like. And as you do this, just seeing if you can let in whatever feelings arise without messing with them, just caring. Maybe imagining the sounds, recalling things that were said. You can activate any of the senses. Maybe there was smells or tastes, feelings in the body. Just calling them to mind and letting it in. Now I want to move on and see if you can find uh, an image of your mind of like after this amends was made, uh, when it, it felt complete or good. Maybe you're just facing the same person and, and some um, resentments were gone or there was more closeness. Or maybe you just walking outside and feeling more light of step, more free. Just see if you can call to memory some place or experience where the wholeness of this atonement 
felt real. And if this is hard, you can just sort of let the emotional memories of it and your thoughts kind of swirl around, that's fine. Just take a minute to sort of imagine all the people in this city. Let's start by just calling to mind the people who are on the screens you've been looking at in this meeting. People all throughout the city, every one of whom has been harmed and has done harm. every one of whom is part of this whole the world inseparable. Just picturing people, you could just imagine someone sitting in their kitchen right now or walking down the street. Why not animals? Everyone's included. Let's let the awareness settle down. Let go of all this visualizing. Just notice this breath right now. Let however you feel be held in the field of compassionate awareness. Just know all oh, my ancient twisted karma. Born of beginningless greed, hate, and delusion. Born from body, speech, and mind. I now fully vow. I take refuge in Buddha. I take refuge in Dharma. I take refuge in Sangha. May all beings everywhere throughout space and time be free from suffering. All right. Thank you all very much for your kind attention. I think it's time to invite some other voices. Um, yeah.